票吗？扣了三分，啊，扣十分。我操，我也没有奖金，要扣几分？没有证明，没有奖金。
found the force per unit area vector acting on this plate. Now the problem states that if you pull in this direction with 25 MPa, it will fail. So the normal stress will be equal to Tn fibers of n fibers, and this number is equal to, uh, sorry, if you do the calculations, tn dot n, you'll get 27.5 MPa, which is greater than the 25 specified in the problem. So it has reached, it's, the, the fibers have reached their capacity. The, the state of stress is higher than the capacity of the fibers. Now, for the plane perpendicular to you, n in this case is equal to 1 over root 2, negative 1, 1, 0. The traction vector in this case is equal to sigma transpose n. you'll get a vector. The normal stress in this case on this plane is equal to Tn dot n. This will be equal to 7.5 MPa, which is less than the specified 10 MPa. So it has not reached its capacity perpendicular to the fibers. The shear stress equal to the norm of Tn minus the normal stress, which is 7.5 n. And this will be equal to 11.86 MPa, higher than the 10 MPa, so it has reached its capacity in shear in this, on this plane. So in general, if you design a, a material that has fibers or that has different orientations, then you have to do these kinds of calculations, you have to check certain planes because these are the weak planes in the material. For traditional engineering materials, whether it's, it's uh, uh, geotechnical materials or structural materials, we use failure criteria that are independent of the direction. When we say the failure criteria are independent of the direction, we look at the stress matrix. We don't look at any direction, we just look at the stress matrix. And from the stress matrix, we know whether there is a plane that will reach a maximum shear or maximum normal stress or not. So these are called isotropic uh, failure criteria, where the only the stress matrix is enough for me to know whether the material has failed or not. So the material is homogeneous, every point is, is uh, has the same strength, every direction has the same strength, because every direction has the same strength, all I need to do is just look at the stress matrix, extract some numbers from that stress matrix, and I extract those numbers and I know whether this material has failed or not. And the first such criteria, or criterion, is the maximum shear stress criterion, or stress criterion, and it's simple, it says, calculate your maximum shear stress compare it with a number called tau max that's function of the material if your maximum shear stress reaches tau max the material is failed if your maximum shear stress is less than the tau max then the material is safe now tau max is obtained from the end Of course, you have to start. You have to do a lot of lab experiments initially to, to conclude that this material abides by this failure criteria. So, assuming you've done a lot of material lab, uh, material experiments, you've tried to test this material in many directions, you've tried different failure criteria, tension is the same as in compression, so you conclude that this material fails according to this failure criteria, which states that once the maximum shear stress reaches a number that's always constant, 
it depends on the material, then the material will fail. And so, to calibrate such a material, let's say you, we already know that this material fails according to the maximum shear stress or the thrust criterion, so we take it to the lab and we fade it. Let's say with sigma mass. In this case, the stress is equal to, so in the lab, failed in sigma yield, zero, zero. What's the maximum shear stress here? The maximum difference divided by two, sigma pi over two, and this is your tau max. So if you take it to the lab and you fail it, and you pull it, and it fails at 100 MPa in axial tension, you know that this material constant is equal to 50 MPa. Whether I use that the stress is equal to 4, 2, 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, or whether I use sigma prime, which we showed, was the same, I will get the same maximum shear stress. I will get the same maximum shear stress. So whatever decision I make for this one will be the same decision I make for that. Because they both have the same principal stresses. They both have the same principal stresses, so they both have the same uh, so they, they both have the same principal stresses, so they both have the same maximum shear stress. Now what will happen if I assume that my state of stress is hydrostatic? In a state of stress that's hydrostatic, you'll find that material is not expected to fail. So, if you take the piece to the lab and you put sigma 2,2, two, for example, equal to sigma 3,3, three, three, equal to negative 10 power 6, and sigma 1, one equal to negative 10 power 6, you're not expecting this material to fail. It will only fail once the difference between these reaches tau max. So under an extreme hydrostatic stress tension or compression, the Tresca failure criterion predicts that the material will never fail. Which basically, which makes some, which makes uh, some sense for practical applications. If you take any piece of, of uh, material and, and put it underneath the ocean, it will never fail. Or if you take it, unless you put holes in it, if there are holes or, or there are holes inside where the water cannot get in, then there's an extreme pressure from outside, then there is difference between the pressure from outside and the pressure inside. So you, you're going to have locations where the stress matrix, the, the principal stresses are not equal. And then the difference is what makes it uh, shear or fake. And also it's the same, that's why materials underneath, the, 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 as you go down to the ground, Well, I, I can't say anything about geotechnical stuff, so you guys will know more about it when you go to the geotechnical. Uh, when you continue in the geotechnical, we'll, we'll talk for chance. But in general, under extreme compressions, I do not ex as long as the stresses are equal from all direction or almost equal, you're not expecting the material to fail. So practically speaking, and also this criterion predicts that the material will not fail. So if I would like to represent this graphically, either in 2D or 3D. So I'm going to look at uh, 
coordinate system defined by those principal stresses. And I know I would like to plot this curve. I would like to plot this curve because this curve will tell me when the material will fail because once this number reaches 2 ton mass, I'm about to fail. So I'm going to call this the yield surface or the failure surface. The failure surface of the material, first let's look when sigma 3 is equal to 0. When sigma 3 is 0, this is 0, this is 0. So the it will fail when the difference is equal, when the biggest of this and this and this is equal to da, 2 tau max. And you, if you plot this, you'll get this curve. So, as an example, if both sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 is equal to 2 tau max, then the difference is 0, this is 2 tau max, this is 2 tau max. So this point satisfies this curve. If you look at this point, sigma 1 is equal to tau max, sigma 2 is equal to negative tau max, sigma 1 is tau max, sigma 2 is tau max, the difference is actually 2 tau max, so this point satisfies this curve. And so, and similarly with this point here, and so this tells me any point on that curve, the material will fail. Any point inside the shear max, shear stress, is actually less than tau max. Any point inside the maximum shear stress is less than tau max. So the surface defines the, the yield surface of the material. Now, if I add sigma 3 to the figure, I get this hexagon. Any point on the surface, material fails, or about to fail. Any point inside, material is safe. And this hexagon coins, uh, is Uh, the, the center of this hexagon of this cylindrical shape is the line sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 because what we said is whatever the value of sigma 1 and sigma 2 and sigma 3 is as long as the 3 are equal the material will never fail so this line shows that the, 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 even if it goes to infinity the, the maximum shear stress will always be equal to 0 because the maximum shear stress is just the difference between sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 and that's why this coincides with the line of sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. Now for other, uh, when you guys study, especially for uh, perhaps three technical materials, you get, you, you can take your specimen to the lab. Now this is a lot of work to do, but usually if you have a new material, you want to form, especially in geotechnical materials, you want to find this failure surface, because this failure surface will depend on tension and compression, and will depend on many things, and you might get shapes in 3D that perhaps look like this maybe in compression, uh, whatever. So, so usually if you find a new material or if you're looking into the, 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 what, uh, the geotechnical materials, how they behave, you look at those failure surfaces. Any point inside tells me that the material is safe. Any point on the surface, the material is about to fail. The Tresca failure surface looks like this hexagon that extends to infinity in both directions. 
the other and very successful uh, failure criterion, criterion is the von Mises yield criteria or criteria. And this one is you just look at your stress matrix, you find the von Mises stress, and you compare the von Mises stress with a value that is dependent on the material. And constant for that particular material. Again, this is an isotropic. This is uh, this is independent of the direction. You first assume that this material will fail according to the von Mises yield criteria. Then you take it to the lab. And you apply sigma yield, or you apply a sigma on one until it yields. Then you calculate your von Mises stress, and it turns out to be sigma yield. This is equal to your sigma max. So the sigma max can be obtained from an experiment, lab, an experiment in the lab where you just apply. Uniaxial stress, you find your sigma max, and forever you store this for your material. And now you know that this material will fail when the von Mises stress reaches that sigma max that you obtain from the lab. is to refer to as the maximum distortion energy criterion. Now the reason why it's called the maximum distortion energy criterion is because as we will study later in the consultative laws, for linear elastic isotropic materials, the von Mises stress is a measure of the stress stress causing shape changes. We will study this later in chapter 5 when we start looking at the relationship between the stress and the strain. Now graphical representation, same thing. I would like to draw the relationship that says sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 squared plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 squared divided by 2 is equal to sigma max. I would like to draw this first when sigma 3 is equal to 0 and you get this ellipse which happens to be very close to the Tresca uh, figure surface. When these two were developed, they were very close to each other. The nice thing about the von Mises one is that if you're using a numerical algorithm, 
it's smoothing. They use your numerical algorithm to find, or to, for example, the, your finite element analysis, or any numerical algorithm to find stresses or the failure of materials. You can find that among these stresses smoother, so it's easier to differentiate and easier for numerical applications. The Tresca is not. The Tresca was developed originally uh, and was used for calculations by hand. Now, if you extend this to uh, 3D space, you get a cylinder. The center of that cylinder is sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. And the radius of that cylinder is equal to root 2 over 3 sigma y or sigma x. And the reason why it's equal to root 2 over 3 because we say that the material is yielding once this reaches sigma x or sigma yield. And so the projection is actually root 2 over 3 sigma x. Because we assume the material will fail once the stress reaches sigma yield, 0, 0, which means once sigma 1 reaches sigma max, so this value is sigma max or sigma yield, and the radius is equal to root 2 over 3 sigma max. There are other isotropic failure criteria that, uh, depending on your application, so there's the more <coughs> yield criterion, and there's other. So the last uh, thing in this chapter that I would like to cover is the other measures of stress. So, so far we have studied the Cauchy stress tensor. And what does the Cauchy stress tensor give me? The Cauchy stress tensor gives me the force per unit area acting on the object in space. If I have an object under load, and I extract a small cube, and I look at it underneath the magnifying glass, I can, I can both extract three planes, Extract those three planes, find the traction vectors on those three planes. That's enough to tell me the stress per unit area on any plane at this particular point in the current configuration. But there are other stress measures that have to do with what is the stress on this cube if I look at this cube before it actually deforms. And these concepts are rooted in what we, uh, uh, elementary, uh, in this elementary concept of engineering stress and true stress that we probably studied, or that you guys probably studied in one of your first engineering courses, first year engineering courses, first or second year. So what is the engineering and what is the true stress? So first, before you continue, the Cauchy stress answer is what is equivalent to what we call the true stress, because the deformed shape 
If I look at it, I extract that shape, I extract that cube, look at the stresses, this is the true stress. Now, it's not, the other one is not fictitious, it's just a different method. So, if I have a, let's look at a metal specimen that has an initial length L0 and has an initial area of D0, and then I take it to the lab, I apply a force, and it really extends to L, has a large extension, and the area becomes smaller, and I'm applying it. Now, if you plot, F over E naught versus delta, which is L minus L naught over L naught. For metals, you'll get this curve. We call this the engineer strain, and we'll cover this more in the second, in the third chapter. And we call this the engineering stress, sigma engineer. And usually you, you have the original area, so you divide the force by the original area. But the area is changing as you're applying the force. Because the area is changing as you're applying force, the actual stress in a small cube, if you actually extract the small cube and you look at it, the actual stress is higher than F divided by A0. It's actually equal to F divided by A. So the true stress, if you actually plot the true stress, you'll find it slightly higher. So engineering versus true. And engineering stress versus engineering stream. And this is true stress versus, and I'm going to use a different uh, measure for stream. I'm going to use len L over L0. And we will cover this in chapter 3, why I would choose such a measure. Which is equal to the true stream. Now for metals, we can find a relationship between those, if I know the engineering stress and the engineering strain, for metals, I can find the true stress and the true strain using the relationship as follows. For metals, and again only for metals, A L is equal to A naught L naught. After I keep extending, the metal does not really change its volume and it keeps it keeps its, its volume so that A over A naught, the change in areas is equal to L naught over L. true stress, which is equal to the force divided by A, which is equal to the force divided by A0, multiplied by A0 over A, is equal to F over A0. Now I'm going to utilize that the volume has not changed. Here we put to relate the stress to the, to the strain. find the engineering stress, if you multiply it by 1 plus your engineering stream, you'll get your true stress for metals. If the engineering strain is small, if you're talking about 5% or 2%, then the true stress is equal to the engineering stress. But once this becomes 20%, 20% stream means a huge decrease in the area, a huge decrease in the area means your true stress is much higher than your engineering stress. And that's why at higher strains, that's when they need it. And the true strain, which we will learn about 
in the next chapter is equal to the logarithmic strain or the logarithmic function of L over del naught, which is equal to then 1 plus delta over del naught, which is equal to then 1 plus epsilon engineering. Now the nice thing about this function is that when this is very small, the true and the engineering strain actually coincide. At higher strains, that's when they deviate, but at very small strains, they coincide. So this is in a uniaxial case. The extension of this in a, uh, in a three-dimensional case is what we call the first Piola Kirchhoff stress and the second Piola Kirchhoff stress. This is a cube inside. After deformation, this cube assumes this shape. And because this is a very small cube, I can assume that the relationship between these vectors is described by a matrix F that takes U, B, and W and give me F U, F B, and F W. In the deformed chain, I have a traction vector, let's say 130, as an example. vector as if I have another traction vector here. Now before we so the force acting on N is equal to the area multiplied by Tn. So look at the force acting on N as if it's equal to area, area multiplied by the engineering stress. rather than the true stress tensor. And this measure P is equal to, it is called the first piola kirchhoff stress. This first piola kirchhoff stress is a, is, a, is a stress measure that is equivalent to the engineering stress, and when multiplied by the original area, the original curve, gives me the 
same force. F acting on M is equal to the force acting on M. The force acting on M is equal to the area multiplied by the true stress. acting on N is equal to the original area multiplied by the engineering stress. Now if you remember a while back, we made a relationship, or we found a relationship between this AN and this AN. And the relationship was as follows. This A multiplied by n is equal to the determinant of f multiplied by f negative transpose multiplied by a multiplied by n. So I'm going to use this here to find the relationship between the true stress and the engineering stress. So this is called the first Fiola Kirchhoff stress. P is called first Fiola Kirchhoff stress. <coughs> so the stress matrix is symmetric. <coughs> F is not a symmetric matrix, is not necessarily a symmetric matrix. And P is not necessarily a symmetric matrix. So P is not necessarily a symmetric matrix. And you should find an example of matrices. When you multiply them by each other, like that you get P, <coughs> get a P that's not necessarily symmetric. There's another measure of stress called the second of Kirchhoff stress, which is symmetric and gives me the following. So if this is the original Q. And this is the force F acting on N, which we said it's the same force acting on this cube after it deformed, 
Now, this is n with an area e. This is n with an area e. This is fn, which is equal to fn. The Q has to form by a matrix F, by the action of the, of the linear uh, transformation F. Now I can take this Fn and transform it back with negative F. Uh, sorry, uh, with F minus 1. F2 capital N is equal to a stress, a fictitious stress matrix S multiplied by N. This is what I call second Euler Kirchhoff stress. And this is what I would like to find. Now F2N is equal to F minus 1 multiplied by the actual force Fn or is equal to F minus 1 multiplied by the actual force F capital N whether you use the engineering stress for the true stress to find this force it doesn't matter F minus 1 Fn is equal to area sigma transpose N or is equal to F minus 1 Fn is equal to A P N which shows that the S is equal to F minus 1 P or F minus 1 sigma transpose F negative transpose multiply by the determinant of And the nice thing about this S is that if you guys remember, you probably did this in your assignment. If, if S sigma is, is symmetric, then S was, will also be symmetric. And there is an example in your notes where all these are used. And there's an example in your assignment that you also have to use all those stress matrices to find. So first you find your first peel the Kirchhoff stress and the second peel the Kirchhoff stress and it's just a simple multiplication of matrices you're given F, you're given uh, sigma so you calculate your S or you calculate your P and you use these to calculate the forces by simply multiplying these matrices by the area vectors so this is it for chapter 2 and everything that I'd like to talk about for the stress matrix and I would like to just start chapter 3 just to talk quickly about what the information and what's straight without really uh, going, going into too much detail so I'll give you uh, 7 minutes and we'll start at 10.20 on this call. Thank you.